So I want to start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also to recognise elders past and present from other Aboriginal communities other than Ghana. So this is a topic that's very dear to me, and it has been particularly dear to me uh, for the last 14 years, because it was in 2002 that I was requested to really do an almost impossible task, which was to review child protection as an all of government framework and how that might be better addressed. I was given 12 months to do it. I was the sole reviewer and I had a very hardy team of three uh, people um, and that included a PA, so I really had very limited research. But what I did over that period of 12 months was nine months was extensive consultation. So I did personal and group interviews with over 78 people. I did multiple consultations with six advisory groups that were set up to work in teams around departments and services. I also uh, received 213 odd submissions and I read numerous, numerous reports. So there are a number of things that I learnt from that. Um, and one of the, thing, the big things was the siloing, and you probably still hear about that now, of budgets and the ways in which departments work. The problems with sharing information and how many of you in that room would still know that to be a continuing problem. But one of the key things that I learnt from that was the importance within a framework of having early intervention as well as response mechanisms to the tertiary end of child abuse. And that far too little money was spent on the early interventions and strategies and too much money, I mean you can't say too much money, but more money was being spent on the tertiary end and that is still the problem. One of the things that I said at that time, and I love quoting myself, it's not too often I can actually get the privilege of quoting myself and find out that it still actually stands up. That's the, sometimes you're looking at something and you think, oh my God, I said that. Um, but this, in this instance, I'll quote myself. So viewing child protection initiatives from a narrow perspective of child abuse and neglect will not result in improved outcomes to children and young people as a population group. And further I said, best outcomes and value for money are not necessarily programs or initiatives that are grounded, sorry, that are generally associated with preventing child and abuse and neglect per se, but broad programs. So what I suggested in that was that there should be a framework which required universal and primary services, and some things did emerge from that. The home visiting scheme emerged from that. Selective or secondary services to target those at risk to prevent child abuse or neglect occurring in the first place, so we do know what the risk factors are. And indicated or tertiary services in response to high-risk children and their families. But what was clear to me was that there was a dearth of information about evidence-based assessments of programs. There are so many programs that have been done. Some were short-funded. They only lasted three years. The money ran out. Some of them were very promising but were not assessed. So I finished that report on time in 2003. And a year later in 2004, not as a consequence of my review, although I'd like to think it was so, um, but the federal government actually decided they would fund an Australian Centre for Child Protection. And they were going to fund it with a grant of $10 million. It wasn't granted all in one year, it was eked out over a period of 10 years, with the idea that it would be self-supporting by 2014. And it opened its doors in 2005, and the first director of that was Dorothy Scott, who many of you would know in this room, and who is still doing amazing work, although she's done amazing work throughout her life in this really important area. And she was the one that set the centre 
on the straight lines that it still follows to this day as being a really good model. So it was set up to conduct research into the causes and impacts of child abuse and to develop national education and training programs. That was what the, the funding was for. And Professor Scott, when she became uh, the first director of the centre, focused on three things. And these still, to, still today are the defining characteristics of what the centre's about. First of all, research. Secondly, professional education and development. And thirdly was advocacy. So this is what the uh, centre still does in its various ways. And it's the only national centre in Australia which has all of those three areas which it is an expert in. As you've heard from Fiona, it takes an evidence-based approach and it's applied uh, information, applied evidence. So it means that practitioners can translate what the research reveals into how it is that it can be implemented. That's, I think, one of the most important ingredients. You can't endlessly be reading studies and not know what to do with it. So the centre actually works to show how it can be applied and work with people so that it can be applied. And I'll give you an example of that towards the end. It also defines what is best practice. And it also aims to bridge the gap between what is known and what is done to transform all of the areas in which there need, needs to be action to transform abuse and to make sure that it is prevented in the future. Now the ACCP, the centre, has itself been reviewed and that's always a very good thing because we know that what we're doing is actually achieving results. So in 2013, a group called DESERT, and I won't, the, the acronym is even too long for a, a tweet actually, um, so I won't say what it is, but what it decided was that the centre had developed a strong reputation for excellence. It had a high level of influence in the child protection sector and in particular influenced the shaping of the National Framework for Protection of Australia's Children 2009 to 2020, which is still the way in which the federal government is spending money under that strategic plan. It was noted that uh, the centre had built a knowledge base it had used its research to influence social policy or child protection policy. Importantly, it was a public health model. And this is where you need universality. The public health model looks at what you need to address the population as a whole, risk population and then the tertiary. That's how the public health model works. It had developed learning standards for professions and importantly, it was supervising and mentoring up-and-coming young academics and practitioners to go into the field of child protection. So to keep the movement happening with people that are skilled. It was, had done well with communicating its research. It had created a hub for child protection research policy development and program evaluation and it had established networks within government and non-government service providers. So that's what the federal government review body found were the high points of the uh, centre's activities. So you've heard 2014 is a big year for us. It's the first year of standalone. Our money has ceased. So the funding, the major funding, is done through securing grants and contract research um, and consultancies and we also have some philanthropic uh, but most of it comes from self-activated work. In other words, the excellence of the centre is in turn producing <coughs> the ability for us to continue to have contracts. We have this year the creation of the Endowed Chair in Child Protection and we have the very first inaugural uh, chair of that, uh, Fiona Arney, and uh, an excellent example she is for an inaugural chair. 
And that inaugural chair came about through a range of philanthropic and private donors, and it means that this chair will be here in perpetuity. And that's a very, very important feature because it's securing the longevity of the organisation that makes the difference. This year, although we have a very small staff, three scooped awards within UniSA as the, in the Division of Education, Arts and Social Sciences, they received excellence awards within the university itself. And that was Dr. Sarah McLean, who you'll be hearing from her today, Professor Bromfield, whom you will also be hearing from, the Deputy Director, and also Kate Greenfield, who's been running around being anonymous, but is a wonderful um, uh, centre's coordinator. And without her, I don't think any of us would be able to exist. Fiona says no. <laughs> Uh, we've also been recently uh, relocated from Underdale. We felt as though we were out in the sticks, but we're now right on North Terrace, which is very key. It means that we can work within the university and we are doing more collegiate work within the uh, university faculties so that we are drawing together within University SA, as well as being co-located near um, service providers and other partnerships that we have developed over a period of time. We have the first ambassador uh, for children, as you've heard from Fiona, and we are doing some research with her because um, uh, Auntie uh, uh, Sue Blacklock is also the chair of Wingang, Wingangagay, Winangay, I always get that wrong. I've said that wrong about 15 times in the last week. Um, but uh, there is some wonderful coordinated research being done there on kinship, Aboriginal kinship in order to promulgate and retain uh, foster carers for Aboriginal children to enable the principles of Aboriginal placement to in fact operate. In 2014, our networks around Australia and also internationally have extended to more than 300 academics, practitioners, policy makers and experts whom we work with on a daily basis. So why do we need this continuing research? The Productivity Commission in 2009-2010 estimated that 2.5 billion was spent directly on child protection and out of home care in Australia. That is a mammoth amount of work and a mammoth amount of money and one wonders is it being placed in the best places to be able to change the situation of child protection. And the statistics on that, child abuse and neglect is one of the most significant social problems experienced by children from all income spectrums and family types. It's estimated between 5 to 10% of Australians have experienced some form of abuse while growing up and approximately 37,000 children living in state care. Research from Australia, and this is taken in 2008, and I'm not sure the extent to which this has been updated, looking at Fiona. The, <laughs> the, state, the state figures, I'm about to quote 2008 figures, and I think this might be indicative that this is the best figures we have at the moment because you need to do some research in order to find out the figures. So that in 2008, um, of all children born in 1991, almost a quarter had been notified to child protection by the age of 16. For Aboriginal children, this was almost 60%. And even more startling, more than half of the Aboriginal children born in 2002 were the subject of notification by the time they were four years old. So you can see we have a lot of work to do. So the future for the centre, um, we will be looking to activating our business model through partnerships of all sorts and to continue the groundbreaking applied research, the tertiary education and training. And one of the important features that I'll underscore today is working directly with communities. In other words, the child protection cannot work if it's done within cells. We've actually got to engage the whole community in the process because it's everybody's business. 
People can't keep saying, oh, it's the government that's got to do that. It's this that's got to do that. That organisation's got to do that. We've all got to do that. And I think that's one of the primary messages that the centre has to put out, and so do you as practitioners that work in this field. I'll uh, finish with giving you a snapshot of three projects which are not going to be uh, spoken <coughs> of later today to show you some of the breadth of the work that we're doing and uh, the, uh, the equivalent of a blog because each one of these has got depth to it which I'm not going to be able to promulgate now. The first is protecting and nurturing children, building capacity, building bridges. Now that was federally funded, you could probably tell that by the length of the title. Um, but uh, that was involved working in partnership with 12 communities around Australia and project staff built relationships with key people to have intersectoral collaboration to develop skills, confidence and knowledge and child and family sensitive practice, particularly in the adult services. So what was being found is that people were going into the adult services, they had all of the risk factors, but the adult services were not saying, well, what's happening with the children? Have you got children? There wasn't even that question. So it was knowing that there are certain risk factors that are likely to have some connection with abuse, where they're going into adult services first and not to child services. So it was to engage everybody to talk together in the same space. There were practice workshops delivered to over 1,900 practitioners, more than 250 agencies. And it's reinforcing that notion that protecting children is everyone's business. The second one is the signs of safety. Anyone heard, heard about that, Western Australia? A few nods around? Good. Um, that was actually a uh, program that, or a framework that was developed and implemented within uh, Western Australia and has actually already been adopted by 11 or 12 countries overseas. But at the moment, and it is at the moment, now being assessed, but it hadn't actually been assessed. So this is where the Centre for Child Protection is in fact involved in some very important work because it is a very promising framework. And uh, it has engaged in a three-year program of research to look at uh, what is being done and whether or not it's being implemented in accordance with how it was developed in the first place and whether or not it is effectively translating um, into practice child prevention and uh, dealing with child abuse and neglect. And it's mainly the child abuse and neglect factor that is the focus of it. And there will be, or there are already some uh, papers that have been developed from that, but they will continue to come out and you'll be able to find them on the website. The third one I'll mention is homelessness services. This was uh, in 2009, the Centre won a small grant to explore how homeless services were responding to dependent children and the findings of the research were circulated widely. As a result of the research, policy has changed. Dependent children were regarded as the clients of homelessness services. That was the important ingredient. Treat the child as the client, not the family as the client and that they were entitled to have their needs addressed in response to what their needs were as vocalised by them. And service provision has changed, so service providers were responsible for addressing them as distinct from the uh, parent uh, carer. So in finalising, what I'd like to say is this. In comparison with what was known when I finished the Child Protection Review in 2013, we now know a lot more about what needs to be done and we know a lot more about what works. But are we doing what we know effectively and are we doing it early enough? To me that is the crucial issue that I think we all ought to be addressing at some point and I hope our new Royal Commission in South Australia will be part of that. And at this stage, thank you very much and have a great day.